Now we'll go on to the dissection cases. The thing I noticed about the dissection cases, again, we've got four. The thing I noticed about them is that one of these cases was a CTA of the chest with appropriate bolus timing for evaluation of the aorta, one of them. All the others were cases where you would not expect to see an aortic dissection uh, and certainly would not be the first choice of any referring clinician suspecting aortic dissection, right? So one of them was this, a routine ab pel. The other one uh, was a non-contrasted CT of the neck. And the third one was a CT of the chest for PE with bolus timing for PE. Right, so uh, that is something that I wanna harp on. When you look at any case that has any amount of aorta in it, <laughs> right? Uh, contrasted or non-contrasted, you need to be very careful and thoroughly evaluate that, uh, that aorta. So the thing that I think is interesting about this, you can see a linear defect that does run through the entire uh, abdomen pelvis uh, aorta. It, it is tough to see, and it's very fine. And the funny thing about this was all these experts had looked at this case before I came along, and not one of them spotted that asymmetry of the nephrograms. Not one person had commented on it. And I couldn't believe that. I mean, there, were, there was all this back and forth discussion. One uh, expert said, well, I think that's an artifact in the aorta. Really, an artifact uh, creating asymmetric nephrograms. Right? And this whole thing really spins on the asymmetry of the nephrograms. And the reading radiologists actually noticed it too. Unfortunately, they kept focusing incorrectly on the left kidney, thinking that the left kidney, for some reason, was the abnormal nephrogram. So you can see this uh, report, and this is another thing I want you to watch out for. When you really find yourself going on and on and on, you are almost certainly creating notes, but no music, right? You're probably missing the big picture. So this, uh, this report kind of goes on and on. You can tell he doesn't know what to conclude uh, from these findings, and then, to make things worse, he came back and did an addendum that's even longer and is even more obvious that he doesn't really know what's going on. So this one, uh, he got dinged for not setting comparisons and for hedging correctly. All right, so this patient came into the ER with left flank pain, got a routine abdomen pelvis with contrast. It was interpreted as a recently passed stone no final was issued. This was over the holiday week between Christmas and New Year's. And so uh, there's another reason why your prelim may not be uh, very much security against med mal. So then two days later, with no further testing, the patient died in front of his wife and small daughters, which uh, led to obviously some commiseration uh, for the plaintiff's side. So this was estimated to be five to seven million dollars total, chance of success 60 a portion liability 25%, and our estimated settlement was thought to be somewhere in the order of 600,000. And as you can see, we got out with 850,000 in indemnity. And there is that linear billing defect. It's tough, the more you look at it, the more you say, yeah, okay, it's there. But that is a tough call. And without the asymmetric nephrograms, I, I doubt anyone would make it. Keep your options broad mentally. I always used to say, why do you even read the clinical history? Just assume it's a patient that was in a car wreck with a fever and a history of metastatic disease. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have not looked at that yet. Uh, I'll call you next week with that, JP. <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely, I, I could go back and do that. So I will will do so. 
All right, so this against us, we had the devastating testimony from the wife and daughters about the experience they had, the fact that this man was a perfect husband and father, so uh, damages were weighted by lost wages and loss of consortium. Uh, the radiologist was deemed intelligent, experienced, and well-spoken, and New Hampshire is trending more toward plaintiffs, but it's traditionally been the most conservative of the New England states, and boy, is that true. I was at Dartmouth, and uh, they are definitely, they're one of the most conservative uh, states in the country, really. All right, so next dissection case. This one is the CT of the neck without contrast. But there are a few things that actually make this a possible diagnosis. For one thing, you can see there are actually surgical clips. This patient had had a previous aortic injury that had been repaired. So is probably at risk, right, with altered dynamics uh, for developing a dissection. You can see the flap. You can see it in the ascending aorta. You can see it in the arch extending up into the branch vessels. And there's even clot in the false lumen on the posterior aspect of the arch near the isthmus, right there, right? So it is possible to see it, but obviously it's a non-contrast CT of the neck for a patient with neck and jaw pain. And it's really not something that's gonna be foremost in your mind. But we basically read this as normal. Gets a 10 out of 10 for reporting. Good radiologist. Look at her uh, MMR was 0.69. So this patient presented to the ER at 3 p.m. with neck and jaw pain, was transferred to another facility and admitted, and then died at uh, 2 a.m. with no further testing. So the initial demand was 18 million, and this brings up an interesting point. When, if you are ever involved in a lawsuit and are told the initial demand, please forget it. It's nothing but posturing, it's based on nothing, and they're always just ridiculous over the top. And I always imagine radiologists being told this, right? They have no other information except that a claim has been filed and they're told the initial demand is 18 million. 18 million? Don't worry about it. It's ridiculous. It, it never comes. Uh, it never comes to that, basically. So the estimated verdict we thought would be between one and two million. Chance of success thirty. Apportioned liability sixty. But some interesting other factors here. Financial indiscretion. This patient was heavily in debt. Uh, he was a gambler, actually. It turns out. The chance of surgical success was put by one of the surgery experts at only seventy-five percent. And while some people bring that up, you'll see it occasionally in some of these cases, it's rarely factored into the actual monetary award like this. So the estimated settlement we thought would be four to 500,000, and it was very close to that at 400,000. So these were the comments in the depositions I thought interesting. Plaintiff incapable of saving, mortgage value higher than house value, lifespan adjusted down for smoking and obesity. They actually get this is one of the few things people pay economists to do. They actually get economists to come and estimate your lifespan and your earnings potential, and that is uh, heavily weighted in terms of determining these indemnities. Uh, disturbing for the legal team were the fact that the referrings were taking deposition shots at the radiologist. One suggesting that a CT of the neck, without contrast, mind you, is a perfectly adequate study for excluding aortic dissection. <laughs> the things people say uh, in, these, uh, in these cases are pretty striking. All right, so on to our next one. There is a lot of mediastinal fluid density, and you can actually see both a flap and differential densities in that aortic root. There's a hyperdense pericardial effusion, probably even causing some early tamponade. You've got hepatic venous reflux there. So this was read as a small to moderate pericardial effusion was all, right? You've got to explain that mediastinal stranding. I think of all the findings, that's the one that you, you just, you can't move on when you see something like that. Uh, and again, you, you can see the differential uh, density in the aorta, but you've probably noticed as well, this was done for PE, right? The bolus timing is such that you've got good pulmonary arterial opacification, but really not so in the aorta. So this got a nine out of 10. It just lacked follow-up recommendations, but was otherwise considered a good report. So this patient came in with chest pain, was admitted 
The CT was interpreted as a pericardial effusion. A CT neck was performed 10 days later and a VRAD radiologist read it and identified the dissection, but the uh, patient was unfortunately not able to be saved. It did, he did go to surgery, but died soon thereafter. So the initial demand here was 9 million, again, ridiculous. The estimated verdict was thought to be 5 million, the chance of success 40, the apportioned liability 45, and the estimated settlement 1 million. This almost went to trial, and I don't think it should have. I, had, I was actually deposed on this one and uh, they settled on the in the last hour. No kidding, my bags were packed. I had a ride to Santa Fe. I was going to be at that trial for the week and they called me at 6 a.m. Uh, that morning that I was gonna leave and said, ah, oh, we settled for one four. So uh, the findings were missed repeatedly. Echoes and additional imaging um, and asymmetric pulses were noted on clinical exam. The finding was missed by the defendant's expert witness the defendant's surgical expert predicted a 25 to 40% operative mortality under any circumstance. So again, someone being honest there and saying, hey, this might not have been fixable. Uh, this line I loved, the opposing counsel is established, well-respected and successful. And uh, this is the guy that deposed me. And he, he was, you could tell, he was one of those silver foxes, you know. Uh, and uh, of course, my problem in a deposition is I'm going to talk too much. And so I was making a willful effort to, to be quiet. And so I would just say one sentence and then I'd clam up and the guy would lean forward and he'd go. <laughs> Sometimes it worked. All right, uh, another thing that factors into these, the radiologist acknowledged the error and was a reluctant witness. If the radiologist is a reluctant witness, it really, so, you know, most of, our parent entities, most radiologists for that matter, are subject to uh, not having the right to pursue these things or to refuse, right? The, ultimately, the people who can decide who goes to, which case goes to trial and which doesn't are not the radiologist. It's oftentimes it will, that, that decision will reside with the parent company or with the insurance carrier. But for the most part, the radiologist doesn't get to say this goes to, we're taking this to trial or we're not, right? Ultimately, that decision is made by others. But if the radiologist is a notably and markedly reluctant witness, it does move that needle. And a lot of these parent companies or insurance carriers are reluctant to go to court if they don't have a radiologist that sincerely wants to defend themselves on the stand. 